everyone, welcome back to the Study Tube Project. Today you are with me, Rosie, aka Just Little Real on Instagram. I was very unsure what to do for today's video, but on Twitter you guys voted for anthropology related video and I thought I have never actually discussed what anthropology is, either on this channel or on my own channel. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to have a quick lesson in what anthropology actually is because the term anthropology is probably new to most of you. It is also more of an um umbrella term than a straight subject term because there are so many disciplines of anthropology within the wider discipline. So we're just going to talk about it and I'm going to talk about some of my feelings towards the subject, where it started, where its history lies and hopefully you will have a taste of the subject by the end. Perhaps some of you are wanting to maybe do this for university so I can tell you what subjects I did for A-level as well to get into this course and it'll just be a bit of a bit of informative fun. An extremely simplified definition of anthropology is that it is the study of people, society and culture. On a basic level it is kind of similar to sociology and in fact when I did sociology A-level a lot of the big names that came up there including Malinowski and Evans Pritchard are actually anthropologists and not sociologists. As you mind blown, <laughs> mine was when I started my course and I realised I'd heard of these people already. Now anthropology in the modern day can be looking at anything from indigenous people to just inner city dwellings. There are plenty of anthropologists now who are in schools, in hospitals and you know just simply studying how things work in society. However, originally anthropology does have its roots in colonialism and I'm going to talk a bit about that because it is an uncomfortable history of my own discipline but it is a necessity to be spoken about. So in order to start this discussion I'm going to be looking at Franz Boas who is an anthropologist from the 1900s. He is colloquially known, at least by Google anyway, as the father of modern anthropology. And this piece that he wrote in the Science Journal in 1904 starts to criticise some of the origins of anthropology and the original, well, motives behind the subject. So I'm just going to read out exactly what he put and I'll put it on the screen for you to read along at the same time. At the present time, anthropologists occupy themselves with problems relating to the physical and mental life of mankind as found in varying forms of society from the earliest times up to the present period and in all parts of the world. Their research bears upon the form and functions of the body, as well as upon all kinds of manifestations of mental life. Accordingly, the subject matter of anthropology is partly a branch of biology, partly a branch of the mental sciences, among the mental phenomena, language, invention, art, religion, social organisation and law have received particular attention. So in short, he is saying that anthropology is the study of people both biologically and socially and what's going on in their minds, but with particular focus on things like religion, social organisation, law and art. So Franz Boas goes on to discuss that indigenous groups that lived far away from the Western scholars were originally curious curiosities. Now these people who would go out, these colonizers essentially, would go out as explorers and bring back things that they deemed to be exotic or interesting. Sometimes these might have been bargained for, they could also be stolen, there are lots of different papers on this and I'm going to link a few of them in the pinned comment but essentially initially you had people who were both antiquarians and curiosity explorers and where museums started was in these cabinets of curiosity which is essentially old rich scholars in the UK in particular but also France, Spain had basically cabinets, glass cabinets where they stored the curiosities that they brought back and this is where the idea of a museum comes from displaying these objects and this is the very beginnings of anthropology and also archaeology and why the two are so intertwined. Now this is before Boas explains anthropology was really anthropology. This was more people collecting things that weren't theirs but interested them because they had the power, they were 
the dominant group so they just took things and studied them whether they were allowed to be doing that or not. So Boaz explains that this in itself was not anthropology, this is where the discipline's origins lie but the actual anthropology started later when these people weren't just bringing things back but started to study these objects and the people that they took the objects from in a relational way. And he says, it was only when their relation to our own civilization became the subject of inquiry that the foundations of anthropology were laid. So what Boaz is saying is that anthropology started when these scholars started really comparing a sort of us and them dichotomy. This us and them dichotomy is essentially the white west compared to indigenous communities elsewhere who these white male scholars felt detached from but also wanted to learn about how they were connected what things did were done the same, what things were done differently, why was one group more advanced than the other group? Now the main undertones around this origin of anthropology is essentially seeing why are some forms of man primitive, so to speak, horrible word, but why are some forms of man primitive and yet living at the same time? Why has the West developed as it has and how has it done this when other groups are still, and again, excuse the word, savages? That is the word that was used at the time. It is avoided now at all costs, unless you are talking about the origins of anthropology. So Boaz goes on to explain that anthropology owes its origin to the great zoologists of the 18th century, so that's the 1700s. And in conformity with the general systematic tendencies of the time, the main efforts were directed towards a classification of the race of man and to the discovery of valid characteristics by means of which the races could be described as varieties of one species or as distinct species. So these scholars were trying to work out whether people who looked differently to them were the same species or different species. And obviously this is very, very problematic, but that is where the discipline started. Now, the phrase systematic tendencies of the time refers to this general belief in social evolutionism. It's essentially a theory of how society developed and that same concept of why are some communities developing at different rates to others. Now, the whole definition of the word developing and civilized is so debatable and so archaic in its origins. You know, civilized to these Western scholars was seen as this capitalist society and how the exploits of colonialism were seen as part of that. You know, they had the means to travel out, they had the means to explore, they had the means to be rich. That to them was seen as civilized and they were looking at why these other groups hadn't done the same thing, why their tools were perhaps not as advanced, so to speak, as the tools that they had themselves. Now, a good example of this social evolutionist concept can be seen in the Pitt Rivers Museum and General Fox, Pitt Rivers, is that his name? <laughs> I hope it is, because it was my degree. He has, essentially his exhibit is still up in the Pitt Rivers because it documents the history of the discipline and it is a show as to why we do not put things in museums like this, still why that is racist, why it is not okay. And it is a way of really teaching how racism is so intermingled with the foundations of the countries in the West and particularly the UK, just how deep systemic racism really goes. And that is a necessary thing to teach people about. As you have seen from everything that's going on at the moment, I think having a background in anthropology has made it so much more obvious as to what is going on and what is still so present in today's society and where it came from and why it needs to be fixed. So I'm gonna put some pictures of his exhibit on the screen. Basically, he arranged everything in a so-called order of evolution. So it's not ordered by date, like a lot of modern museums are today. It's not categorized by geography. He grouped items by type as the only kind of grouping thing. It was a typological classification system where he ordered 
it was rifles was his original one. He basically ordered weapons from most primitive to most evolved. And at the beginning was all sorts of things from across the British Empire that were from similar time periods to the things he's got from the West at the evolved end, but he'd also included tools that were from the West, but from thousands of years ago at the beginning. So what he was doing was organizing essentially what he believed to be human evolution by object. And this justifies this whole racist belief of we are the better race. And, oh, <laughs> That's disgusting. So essentially the early scholars were trying to make sense of this slow advance from savagery to civilization. That is a quote again from Boas 1904. And it is the stimulus for this study of the other, the other being the indigenous people at this period in time anyway. So Boas writes that our civilization became the standard, the achievements of other times and other races were measured by our own achievements. And this was part and parcel to the beginnings of anthropology. It was an endeavor to establish a schematic line of evolution, which naturally led to new methods of classification in which each group bears some form of genetic relation to the other. And genetics were and still are actually very central to anthropology these scholars wanted it to be biological. Everything was seen to come down to biology. Are these people more advanced because of their biology? Does this mean they're a different species to us? Now the origins of language also played a key part in the beginnings of anthropology and it was one of the most discussed problems in the 19th century due to its relations directly to the development of culture. So Steinthal explained that thought is molded by the whole social environment of which language is part. And another method of classifying mankind was looking at the development of different languages and where they came from. Now this did actually pose a problem for early anthropologists because groups that looked the same, groups that had similar cultures may have had completely different languages or groups that looked completely different may have shared a language. But, you know, things weren't as straightforward as these scholars were trying to make them out to be. And that is where anthropology started. Now I'm going to discuss the sort of modern disciplines and where anthropology has moved towards now. So modern anthropology is split into several sub-disciplines. These are social anthropology, cultural anthropology, biological anthropology, or sometimes known as physical anthropology, medical anthropology, paleoanthropology, linguistic anthropology, and forensic anthropology. So according to UCL, social anthropology is the comparative study of the ways in which people live in different social and cultural settings across the globe. Societies vary enormously in how they organise themselves, the cultural practices in which they engage, as well as their religious, political and economic arrangements. Social anthropologists devote themselves to studying this variation in all its complexity, with a view to contributing to a broader understanding of what it is to be human what unites us as human beings as well as what makes us diverse. So essentially the social anthropology side is the bit that could be seen to be similar to sociology, especially the A-level sociology syllabus. For me that was where that linked into anthropology, it was in that part. So in social anthropology what is being looked at is the deep structure of social relations. This can look at anything from religion to gender to class to literally how people interact with each other and their surroundings. Social anthropology is usually studied using participant observation and ethnography. So ethnographies are detailed depictions of societies that are being studied and these descriptions are shaped and informed by the research questions posed by the anthropologist. These questions might change throughout but a general structure of what sort of thing you're looking for is likely going to be thought out before going to the group or society that you want to study. So originally these ethnographies tended to be about indigenous groups. For example, Malinowski's work on the Trobrian Islands and Evans Pritchard's work with the Exande group in, in Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Nowadays, social anthropologists are as likely to be found carrying out research in businesses, educational establishments, public sector bureaucracies, hospitals, and also still the more traditional remote places. So for example, my tutor at Oxford, she was called Elizabeth Hewitt, and her study area was the Banara people of Brazil. Her book is called Space and Society in Central Brazil, 
a Panera ethnography. Another famous social anthropologist is Zora Neale Hurston. She is also a fiction writer, but she is sort of a pioneer in social anthropology. So Zora was an ethnographer born in 1891, and she wrote a lot on the African-American experience, as well as the race divisions that she was facing as a young black woman at the time. So Hurston was actually trained in anthropology under Franz Boas, who is the guy I was talking about at the beginning, and he encouraged her to look into African-American folklore. She did field work in both the south of the US and in Jamaica and Haiti. She also went to Haiti. And her findings are published in the book Mules and Men in 1935. This was her first major anthropological work and the first collection of black folklore by a black American. Now, Zora was also arguably a cultural anthropologist and I'm gonna discuss the difference between social and cult cultural anthropology now because I think she's a very good example of where Google will tell you two different things because she was American. So in America, cultural anthropology is pretty much what in the UK we would call social. So I personally would say that they both overlap a lot, um, partly are the same thing. There's no real obvious distinction to me personally and I think the main difference is the emphasis of what the study is on. So according to discoveranthropology.org, the term cultural anthropology relates to an approach particularly prominent in the US and associated with the work of pioneers such as Franz Boas and Ruth Benedict. It stresses the coherence of cultures, including their rules of behaviour, language, material creations and ideas about the world and the need to understand each of those in its own terms. Social anthropology, on the other hand, has mainly been developed within Britain since the early years of the 20th century. Historically, it was heavily influenced by intellectual traditions coming from continental Europe, particularly France, and has a tendency to emphasise social institutions and their interrelationships. I'm pretty sure the department at Oxford is called the Institute of Social and Cultural Anthropology, so like I said, I personally think they're very similar. You might want to argue with me on that one. Go ahead, it's fine. <laughs> so a bit more on cultural anthropology. Dartmouth College in New Hampshire is a university and they have said that cultural anthropology addresses broad questions about what it means to be human in contemporary society and culture, as well as those of the recent past. Cultural anthropologists systematically explore topics such as technology and material culture, society and organisation, economies, political and legal systems, language, ideologies and religion, health and illness and social change. So again, this is very similar to the definition given for social anthropology by UCL. Now there is actually a journal of cultural anthropology which is completely open access. It is cultural anthropology, that's the name, but it has been open access for a while so you can access any of the stuff that's on there for free online and I will link it in the pinned comment. So now we come to biological anthropology, which is my favourite part. This definition comes from Cambridge University's website. Biological anthropology takes this comparative approach to exploring human evolution and adaptation. So the comparative approach is that of anthropology as an overarching subject. Comparisons between humans and other animals are used to understand human uniqueness and biological variation. Comparisons across time to unravel the evolutionary history of hominins over the last six to eight million years are also central to part of that, which is paleoanthropology. Investigating variation in human development and health, exploring the mechanisms that generate population differences today and in the past, and looking at individual behaviour in terms of evolution and adaptation and the underlying cognitive basis. It has also been called physical anthropology, and for my undergraduate, my module on this was called physical anthropology, but that definition is iffy and you might see both physical and biological, but essentially it's the same thing. Now, as I explained at the beginning, biological anthropology does have its roots in comparing the physiology of races. Now, that is not the central part of it now. It is pretty much mostly looking at sort of evolution and a little bit of psychology. Why are we different to animals? And also a little bit on animals themselves. So primatology is another big part of biological anthropology and I know when I did this topic in my undergrad we also had an essay on whether animals have culture. So it is all very interlinking, it's still comparative but it is mostly looking at the physical body. 
So on that same note, we have forensic anthropology. A forensic anthropologist is an expert on the body. They have a great understanding of the processes and effects of decay on the body and extracting information pertaining to age, sex, stature, ancestry, and pathology. So at a crime scene, for example, a forensic anthropologist's job is to identify the victim, um, to say how old they might have been, who they might be, assess sex of the skeleton, the stature, and in particular a forensic anthropologist is involved when the body has decayed to the point where it is just bones and we need an expert to return that person to their family and to explain what happened to them. Paleoanthropology on the other hand is in the past, it is in the past past. <laughs> it is a combination of Paleolithic archaeology, which is Stone Age archaeology, and biological anthropology. So looking at how we evolved, you know, who came before us, Neanderthals, Homo heidelbergensis. So my previous video, that was paleoanthropology. And my video on Neanderthals having language, that is paleoanthropology. It is looking at our ancestors to see when things like language developed, when things like culture developed and it is an ongoing study and the evidence is obviously scarce because it's so old but it is very very interesting. Now linguistic anthropology is an area that I really don't have any expertise in. So according to Jay Storr, linguistic anthropology is the interdisciplinary study of how language influences social life. It's a branch of anthropology that originated from the endeavour to document endangered languages and has grown over the past century to encompass most aspects of language structure and use. Linguistic anthropology explores how language shapes communication, forms social identity and group membership organises large-scale cultural beliefs and ideologies and develops a common cultural representation of natural and social worlds. Now finally we have medical anthropology. Again this is not something that I had the chance to do at uni. I just didn't have enough options. It was an option but I didn't take it. <laughs> the medical anthropology is a subfield of anthropology that draws upon a social, cultural, biological and linguistic anthropology together in order to better understand the factors which influence health and well-being. So the experience and distribution of illness is also part of this as well as the prevention and treatment of sickness, healing processes and the social relations of therapy management and also the cultural importance of utilisation of pluralistic One bit of research which would have covered medical anthropology that I have done is into new reproductive technologies. That is a form of medical anthropology because it is looking into the processes available that are run by you know medical health systems but also have an influence on family and gender and just general social relations an area of medical anthropology that certainly needs to be highlighted now is and i'm not entirely sure if there is many people looking into this already but essentially there needs to be more research into the differences in experience between people of different races and ethnic backgrounds in hospitals. That would be a clear medical anthropological ethnography that could take place. Um, it is one that likely could be funded by the government. A lot of medical anthropology is funded because of how important it is to the health system. So I am going to put some useful links in the pinned comment, including some key anthropological thinkers, some key people for each section that I have discussed, and some websites which might help you. I will also link the websites to the definitions that I've used, because different websites might have different definitions, but I have tried to use like reputable sources for all of these definitions. <laughs> And if you have any questions about anthropology, do ask me in the comments. I'm sure there will be other people who have studied this who can help in the areas that I don't really know that much about. But particularly if you have any questions about paleoanthropology or forensic anthropology, then I will likely be able to answer those properly and I'll give anything else a go. If you enjoyed, do give me a thumbs up. and. If you want any more anthropology content, then give me a thumbs up because I really haven't put a lot of focus on that and kind of neglected it because it was my interest lie more in archaeology, so I would like to make sure I'm still bringing this in. <laughs> anyway, I hope you have a good day, I hope you enjoyed, and subscribe to my channel and the StudyTube Projects channel.